The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. And uh, we're going to tell more truth this morning. Going to continue in the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. We're talking about the formation of the military and intelligence wing of the Roman Catholic Church. The formation of the most powerful, the most militant the most dangerous, the most occultic, the most controlling institution on the planet today. We're talking specifically about Ignatius Loyola, the Basque Spaniard who founded the Jesuit order in 1540. We're talking about the early formation, the early days. And uh, this particular... uh, where we left off yesterday is dated uh, in 1534. It's, uh, it says, um, on August 5th, uh, 15th, 1534, feast day of the Assumption of the Virgin into Heaven, the Companions swore oaths of service to the Blessed Virgin in St. Marie's Church at Montmartre and to St. Denis, patron, patron saint of France, in his chapel. Now, first of all, the Bible doesn't even doesn't even uh, discuss the death of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and it is a complete and total contravention of man, a diabolical tradition of man, the diabolical teaching of the Roman Catholic Church about this bodily assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven. She did not experience, after she died, a death of which, of course, and I'm repeating myself, is not even recorded in the scriptures. God's people are not to be concerned about Mary. But the Roman Catholic Church is all concerned about Mary, and so was Ignatius Loyola, and he dedicated his uh, his order to the Virgin Mary, and uh, this so-called Queen of Heaven, and if you want to, if you have a Bible program on your computer, just, just, uh, just type in Queen of Heaven, and see that she is universally condemned in the Scripture. It was an ancient pagan uh, equivalent to Semiramis, the ever-virgin queen of the idolater and the first recorded sinner uh, right after the flood who built the cities in the plains and kept the people captive and taught them to worship the sun and the moon and the stars. This virgin that is celebrated by the Roman Catholic Church is a cultic. It's paganism, and it's a lie. Now, it says on August 15, 1534, on this assumed <clears throat> abominable feast day of the Assumption of the, Vir- of the Virgin into Heaven, the Companions swore oaths of service to the Blessed Virgin in St. Mary's Church at Montmartre 
and St. Denis, patron saint of France, in his chapel. And in parentheses, the author writes, The experience of the Montmartre oaths must have been intense for Francis Xavier, who would become St. Francis in the Roman Catholic Church, apostle to the East, he is known as, made the spiritual exercises with a quote-unquote penitential fervor, says historian Broderick in Origin of the Jesuits. He says that nearly cost him the use of his limbs. So, uh, this, uh, this, uh, idolatrous pagan practice of, uh, of self, uh, flagellation and, uh, and that sort of thing we see so typical in uh, the uh, fervent Roman Catholics uh, was demonstrated by Xavier, Francis Xavier, one of the original uh, members of the Jesuit order. He continues now, he says, They vowed poverty, chastity, and to rescue Jerusalem from the Muslims. Jerusalem is all important to the Roman Catholic Church. They must possess Roman, uh, they must possess Jerusalem. And they've been striving to do that for nearly two millennia. It says, however, should the rescue prove infeasible within a year, they vowed to undertake without question whatever other task the Pope might require of them. Now it was too soon, too soon for the Pope to reign on God's holy hill, so Ignatius Loyola failed in his attempt to take Temple Mount for the Pope and uh, to to claim Jerusalem for the Pope. And so we'll continue now with the book. It says, Well before a year had passed, Clement the Seventh died, and the Jerusalem dream was overwhelmed by more present dangers. Luther's Bible in German was created uh, was creating defection in record numbers throughout Germany, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Remember, the Protestant Reformation was fueled by the fact that the people had the Bible in their own language, could read it for themselves. And when they read it for themselves, their eyes were opened. That the Roman Catholic Church was that woman riding the scarlet-colored beast of Revelation chapter 17, to whom all the kings of the earth paid homage. They were drunk with the wine of that fornication, that illegal uh, intercourse between the kings of the earth and the papacy. And they fled the Roman Catholic Church in droves. For the first time in, in, in Roman history, the Roman Catholic Church was truly threatened. And it was simply because the people were reading God's word for themselves. It says Luther's Bible in German was creating defection from the Roman Catholic Church in record numbers throughout Germany, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. In France, the response to Lefebvre's Bible was so decisive that King Francis I exclaimed that he would behead his own children if he found them harboring the blasphemous heresies acquirable through direct contact with the Scripture. That's right. He'd behead his own kids if he found them reading the Bible or holding to any of the heresies of the Bible. Heresies of the Bible. England was lost in its entirety due not to Bible reading, which Henry VIII prosecuted as avidly as any pope, but to the royal, uh, but to the royal love life. Henry had demanded that Clement VII grant him a divorce from the emperor's Aunt Catherine, and then recognize the Protestant-oriented Anne Boleyn as his new queen. When Clement stood mute, Henry took all of England away from Rome and made himself complete owner of the lands and tenements of England, as well at law as in equity. So here we have an, ad- an ad- adulterous king, Henry VIII, who sought an annulment of his marriage. 
and an approval from the Pope to remarry. And it was not granted by the Pope, so there came a... Uh, well, let's just put it this way. King Henry was going to keep his divine right to rule, rule England, but he was going to kick the Pope out of his life. And so there became this tete-a-tete, this, this feud, this little tiff between Henry VIII and the Pope. And so the, the Vatican viewed Henry VIII as an apostate and having usurped or thrown off the chains of Rome, uh, he was still, uh, wholly corrupted by the Catholic faith. Anyway, Clement the Seventh was succeeded by the oldest cardinal, an erudite humanist with formidable diplomatic skills, 66-year-old Alessandro Farnes. Cardinal Farnes had been privately educated in the household of Lorenzo de Medici and had been appointed treasurer of the Vatican in 1492. He was crowned Pope Paul the Third. Vatican wags called Farnest Cardinal Petticoat because his strikingly beautiful sister, uh, Julia, had been mistress to the licentious Pope Alexander VI, for which some wags named her Bride of Christ. Julia posed undraped for the statue of the goddess Justice that still reclines voluptuously on Pope Paul III's tomb in St. Peter's Basilica. Two centuries later, at the command, uh, at the command, the interests of decency of Pope Pius IX, the first pope to be officially declared infallible, Julia's exposed breasts were fitted with a metal blouse. Paul III is a major figure in the history of the Society of Jesus and consequently of the United States of America since it was he who approved in the summer of 1539 Ignatius of Loyola's business plan. Ignatius proposed a minimal society that would do battle in the Lord God's service under the banner of the cross. The militia would be very small, no more than 60 members, and each would have to take four vows, Poverty, chastity, obedience to the church, and a vow of special obedience to the Pope. They would not be confined to any specific parish, but would be dispersed throughout the world according to the papacy's needs. They would wear no particular habit, but would dress according to the environment in which they found themselves. And I'll just tell you so that they could blend in and not be discovered. Remember? This is the military and intelligence wing of the Roman Catholic Church. Anonymity is important. Their work is a military mission. And their discovery was not to be known generally. He says they would infiltrate the world in an unpredictable variety of pursuits as doctors, lawyers, authors, Reformed, uh, reforming theologians. That's where we get, um, Francisco Ribera and, uh, and Alcazar, the, uh, the twisted doctrinal teachings, uh, called Futurism and Preterism. They were to be financiers, statesmen, courtiers, diplomats, explorers, tradesmen, merchants, poets, scholars, scientists, architects, engineers, artists, printers, philosophers, and whatever else the world might demand and the church require. So they could put on all of these, put on all of these, um, these occupations and use those occupations to gather influence. And uh, that's the stock and trade of the Jesuit order. Infiltration, blending in with the environment and becoming prominent in their field of endeavor and using their opportunity to serve the church in whatever way possible. The end justifies the means, remember. 
he continues, he says, their head would be a superior general. In the constitutions which Ignatius was writing, the superior general would be, quote, obeyed and revered, excuse me, obeyed and reverenced at all times as the one who holds the place of Christ our Lord, unquote. So, like the Pope, the black Pope arrogates to himself the power and authority of Christ himself. It's blasphemy. The foundation of Jesuitism is blasphemy. The phrase, holds the place of Christ, means that the superior general would share with the Pope, at a level unperceived by the general public, the divine title of vicar of Christ. In other words, replacement of Christ. First claimed by Pope Galatius uh, I in May of 13, uh, May 13, 495. Loyola's completed constitutions would repeat 500 times that one is to see Christ in the person of the superior general. 500 times in their constitutions they are reinforced with this blasphemous doctrine that the superior general of the Jesuit order is Christ himself in the person of Christ himself. It says the general's equal status with the Pope, advanced by an obscurity that renders him virtually invisible, is why the commander-in-chief of the Society of Jesus was always, has always been called Papa Nero, the black Pope. The superior general's small army would be trained by the spiritual exercises, remember those demonic, self-hypnotic, uh, occultic, spiritual exercises, self-hypnosis and mind control, brainwashing, to practice a brand of obedience Loyola, Loyola termed extempla, uh, extemplativus in, uh, in actione. In other words, active contemplation, instantaneous obedience with all critical thoughts suppressed. In other words, let me just use their own terms. A Jesuit to his superior general is like a stick in the hands of an old man. They're robotic. They don't think for themselves. They have no earthly ties, no family, no property, no will of their own, no, no private individual thought. No authority to question their commands. No authority to question anything but to respond instantaneously and exactly as they are ordered to do by their superior general. And it says, as stated in section 353.1 of the exercises, it says, quote, we must put aside all judgment of our own and keep the mind ever ready and prompt to obey in all things the hierarchical church. The hierarchical church. But Jesuit obedience would be more than mere obedience of the will. An obedient will, uh, an obedient will suppresses what it would do in order to obey what a superior wants done. Ignatius demanded obedience of the understanding. An obedient understanding alters its perception of reality according to the superior's dictates. Section 365.13 declares, quote, We must hold fast to the following principle. What seems to me white, I will believe black if the hierarchical church so defines. And Francis Xavier would later describe this quality of submission in a vow that unintentionally summarizes the Jesuit, mis uh, the Jesuit mission. He said, I would not even believe in the Gospels were the Holy Church to forbid it, unquote. So you hear often spoken of the Jesuits. When it is necessary, black becomes white and white becomes black. 
Now, how are we to view that? Obviously, they're not talking about color. They're talking about good versus evil. When it becomes necessary and advantageous to the Church of Rome, evil is good and good is evil. And what does the Bible say to those who call evil good and good evil? I believe that specific passage in the Scripture specifically addresses Jesuitism. Certainly, it applies to Jesuitism. And that the, the, the exact words are used is striking to me. Francis Xavier would later describe this quality of submission in a vow that unintentionally summarized the Jesuit mission. I would not even believe in the Gospels where the Holy Church, the Roman Catholic Church, to forbid it. So there's your black is white and white is black. The scriptures can become evil in their mind if to believe so would benefit the Holy Mother Church. And let me just tell you, if you've done any research yourself, you know that the scriptures are the absolute worst enemy of the Jesuit order. It is a weapon of God, the two-edged sword, against which Satan himself has no defense. And it is the Bible that the Jesuits have most attacked. It is the Bible that the Catholic Church has most attacked and suppressed and polluted and corrupted. And it's the business of the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits, if not to corrupt the text of the Bible, as they've done in all the perverted Bible versions that are available today, but they corrupt its teaching. They corrupt its interpretation. And uh, that's evident in the preterist and the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy. Twisting of the scripture. And those two examples are specifically adopted by the Jesuits and promulgated among the Protestant churches to blind their eyes in this generation as to what the Protestant reformers knew and agreed upon universally that the papacy was the, the biblical antichrist. Preterism and futurism are both Jesuit interpretations of Bible prophecy, and each of them are designed and extremely successful in blinding the eyes of God's people as to who the true identity of that whore that rides the bloody beast in Revelation chapter 17. They're masterpieces of deception. Preterism and futurism are the most damaging false teachings in the churches today. With those two interpretations of Bible prophecy, they put God's people, God's true people, completely to sleep about who the biblical Antichrist is. They look either for him in the long-distant past, or they look for him in the long-distance future when Antichrist has been among us ever since the the, the 6th uh, century. And uh, it's the papacy. And uh, it's my purpose here on Inquisition Update to bring this message of truth back to God's people, to anyone who will listen. And certainly, F. Tupper Saucy knew it in his book, Rulers of Evil, and we'll continue with the reading and, and discussion of this book when we return from the break. My name's Tom Fresh. You're listening to Inquisition Update on LibertyRadioLive.com. We'll be right back after this.
The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update. If you'd like to sponsor Inquisition Update and help keep this broadcast on the air, send a note to Nicholas with a contribution. I appreciate your support. Now, we're turning to the book uh, Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy in our discussion about the Jesuit order. It says, The society does not open its extreme oath of obedience to the public inspection. However, a transcript alleged to be a true facsimile was translated by Edwin A. Sherman and deposited in the Library of Congress of the United States with the number BX3705.S56. 
according to this document, now listen carefully, this is the extreme oath of the Jesuits. It's been a while since we've talked about this, and it's nice to review this every now and then. And uh, we're do- we're doing so because it's part of this book. That's why I highly recommend this book. It says, when a Jesuit of the minor rank is elevated to command, he is conducted into the chapel of the convent of the order, where there are three others present. The principal or superior standing in front of the altar. On one side stands a monk, one of whom holds a banner of yellow and white, which are the papal colors. He's talking about the Pope's flag. And the other, a black banner with a dagger and red cross above a skull and crossbones with the initials I-N-R-I. And below them, the words, Ayustum Necker Regis Impious, the meaning of which is, listen carefully, it is just to annihilate impious rulers. Okay, Biblically, these initials represent the Roman inscription above Christ's head on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. But, the, you know, the INRI is normally affixed to a placard above every crucifix. And according to the Jesuit oath, INRI means it is just to annihilate impious kings and rulers and governments. And Christ indeed was a king, a ruler, and a government. And over every crucifix, when you see that placard, in the Jesuits' eyes, it's gloating over the the crucifixion and death of Christ. Now, it may sound shocking to some people, but nonetheless, it's true. Christ is the Jesuit's worst enemy, and so is his word, the Bible. Continuing now with the oath, it says, On the floor is a red cross upon which the uh, the postulant or candidate kneels. The superior hands him a small black crucifix, which he takes in his left hand and presses to his heart, and the superior at the same time presents him a dagger, which he grasps by the blade and holds the point against his heart the superior still holding uh, still holding the dagger by its hilt. The superior gives a preamble and then administers the oath. I, and then he, the, the postulant states his name, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed Michael, the Archangel, the Blessed Saint Paul, and all the saints and sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius Loyola in the pontificate of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin Mary, the matrix of God and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ Vicegerent and is the true and only head of the Catholic and Universal Church throughout the earth and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosing, given to his holiness by my Savior, Jesus Christ, he hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without his sacred confirmation, and that they may be safely destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine and his holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority, whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and the now pretended authority of the churches of England and Scotland, and branches of the same now established in Ireland and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they be usurped and heretical, opposing the sacred Mother Church of Rome. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state named Protestant or liberals, 
or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates, or officers. I do further declare that the doctrines of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name Protestant or Liberals be damnable, and they, that they themselves be damned, and to be damned, who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place wherever I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, England, Ireland, or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to, and do my uttermost to extirpate the heretical Protestants or liberals' doctrines, and to destroy all their pretended powers, regal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with, to assume any religion heretical, for the propagating of the Mother Church's interests, to keep secret and private all her agents' counsels from time to time, as they may be entrusted to me, and not to divulge, directly or indirectly, by word, writing, or circumstance, whatever, but to execute all that shall be proposed, given in charge, or discovered unto me, by you, my ghostly father, or any of this sacred convent. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse or a cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ that I will go to any part of the world, whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions of the north, to the burning sands of the desert of, Ara of Africa, or the jungles of India, to the centers of civilization of Europe, or to the wild haunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever communicated to me. I further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and to exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs of the wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. In confirmation of which I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and all my corporeal powers. And with this dagger, which I now receive, I will subscribe my name written in my own blood, in testimony thereof. And should I, and should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet, and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened, and sulfur burned therein, with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hell forever. All of which I, and he states his name again, do swear by the blessed Trinity and blessed sacrament, which I am now to receive, to perform on my part to keep inviolably, 
and do call all the heavenly and glorious hosts of heaven to witness these my real intentions to keep this my oath. In testimony thereof, I take this most holy and sac- and blessed sacrament, the Eucharist, and witness the same further in my name written with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and sealed in the face of this holy convent. And with this he received the wafer from the superior and writes his name with the point of the dagger dipped in his own blood taken from over his heart. That is the extreme oath of a Jesuit. They are committed to extirpate heresy from off the earth. Whatever the Roman Catholic Church, whatever the Jesuit general declares as heresy, it's to be destroyed. And they use any means necessary. Bible believers, those who hold to the written word of God, the scriptures, are their worst enemy. And it is they who have, they have sought for nigh on to 500 now, uh, 500 years now to extirpate, to completely eradicate from off the planet. Now we've never seen, or at least not to our ability to recognize that kind of religious persecution in this country, but we soon will. A bloodletting in this country the likes of which no one could ever even conceive that could ever happen in good old USA. But Rome's got control of our government now. And there's a Holy Roman Inquisition coming to Protestant America. And that's why this program is called Inquisition Update. When Ignatius concluded his presentation, the Pope reportedly cried out, Hoc est digitus Dei. This is the finger stroke of God. On September 27, 1540, Paul III sealed his approval of the highest and most solemn form of papal pronouncement, a document known as a bull, from the Latin bulla, which means bubble, denoting the attached ovoid or circular seal bearing the Pope's name. Pope Paul's bull ordaining the Jesuits is entitled Regimini Militantis Ecclesia, which means on the supremacy of the church militant. The title forms a cabalistic device common to pagan Roman divining, known as a a notaragon. This device is an acronym that enhances the meaning of its initialized words in the way MAD tells us that mothers against drunk driving are more than against drunk drivers. They're very angry. Regimini Militantis Ecclesia produces the Notaragon Rome, the empire whose salvation the Society of Jesus was ordained by this bull to secure through the arts of war. The following April, the original six and a few other members elected Ignatius of Loyola their first superior general. What had been appro- what had been approved as a minimal society soon multiplied to a thousand strong. Ignatius did this by administrating to only sixty the extreme oath of obedience to the Pope while admitting hundreds more under lesser oaths. Ever since, the exact size of the society has been known only to the superior general. As the world gained increasing numbers of doctors, lawyers, authors, reforming theologians, financiers, statesmen, courtiers, diplomats, explorers, tradesmen, merchants, poets, scholars, scientists, architects, engineers, artists, printers, and philosophers, It was extremely difficult for an ordinary citizen to tell which were Jesuits and which were not. Not even Jesuits could say for sure just of a provision, uh, not even Jesuits could say for sure because of a provision in the Constitution, section 81-86 of part 1, which authorizes the superior or the general to receive agents 
both priestly agents to help in spiritual matters and lay agents to aid in temporal and domestic functions called coadjutors. These uh, called coadjutors, these lay agents could be of any religious denomination. Did you get that now? Listen carefully. Called coadjutors, these lay agents could be of any religious denomination, race, nationality, or sex. They took an oath which bound them for whatever time the superior of the superior general of the society should see fit to employ them in spiritual or temporal services. This provision was availed by so many black popes that the French had a name for people suspected of being Jesuit agents. Les robes petites, which means short robes. And you've heard me talk about short robe Jesuits on the program. One of which uh, would be uh, Pat Robertson. The one who was so happy, smiling, and exuberantly shaking his head, yes, in approval, when Pope Benedict XVI called for full communion to the ecumenical meeting there at St. Joseph's Cathedral last April. Indeed, he is a Jesuit infiltrator into the Protestant churches, no doubt a Jesuit of the short robe. It says the English called them short coats or Ignatians, speaking of these coadjutors. Within two years of Regimini Militantis Ecclesia, Pope Paul III appointed the society to administer the Roman Inquisition, not to be confused with the Spanish Inquisition, which reported only to the Spanish crown. When the Jesuits were comfortable with the Inquisition, Paul made his move to reconcile with the Protestants. And guess how they reconciled with the Protestants? By burning them. If they wouldn't recant of their heresy of Protestantism, they were burned, persecuted like dogs, and their properties confiscated by the church and the secular power of their nation. The Jesuit order took over the Holy Roman Inquisition to extirpate heresy off the planet, and that's their job today. And Few people seem to know even what a Jesuit is. But their job is to extirpate Protestantism off the planet and to create a universal, global, universal religion, a Catholic religion, an ecumenical Catholic religion. And that's what the New World Order is. World conquest. A global government a global religion, and a global economic system all under the control of a single man, the Pope of Rome. Now, we're just about to run out of time, but I'm going to begin in Chapter 8. The title of, the, of it is Moving In. The term Protestant was coined in 1529 to describe the large number of princes and delegates of 14 cities, largely German, who protested Emperor Charles Habsburg's attempt to enforce the Edict of Worms. This edict bound the empire's 300 princely states and free cities to Roman Catholicism. The Protestants proposed a compromise formula, basically a statement of the, Luth of, of the Lutheran faith known as the Augsburg Confession. For 15 years, the Edict of Worms and the Augsburg Confession kept Catholic and Protestant rulers in a Mexican standoff. Then, on December 13, 1545, Pope Paul III called both factions to the small German-speaking northern Italian cathedral city of Trent. The promise was to resolve differences peacefully in an ecumenical council. The Council of Trent had not been seated four months before it decreed that the books and biblical translations of Martin Luther, the leader of the Protestant Reformation, Lefebvre, Zwigli, Calvin, and other quote-unquote unapproved persons 
were, quote, altogether forbidden and allowed to no one. Since little advantage, but much danger generally arises from reading them, unquote. So much for ecumenism, right? So much for settling their differences peacefully. The Council of Trent was for no other purpose than to damn Protestantism and declare it a heresy to be rid of permanently. That was the Council of Trent. And it was run, it was called, and operated by the Jesuit order, whose purpose was to extirpate heresy, to extirpate Protestantism. It says, then the Jesuits moved in. Diego Lainez, Alfonso uh, Salmeron, two of the original companions, and Claude Leger, all three in their early 30s, distinguished themselves at Trent early on by spurning the grand style of their delegates. They set up housekeeping in a narrow smoke-blackened baker's oven and wore clothing so heavily patched and greasy that other priests were embarrassed to associate with them. They carried with them intricate uh, advisories from Ignatius himself, written from the delegate's point of view. For example, it says, When the matter that is being debated seems so manifestly just and right that I can no longer keep silent, then I should speak my mind with the greatest composure and conclude what I have said with the words, subject, of course, to the judgment of a wiser head than mine. If the leaders of the opposing party should try to befriend me, I must cultivate these men who have influence over the heretics and lukewarm Catholics and try to win them away from their errors with holy wisdom and love, unquote. Most of the 18-year lifetime of the Council of Trent consisted of two intermissions spanning four and ten years each. At the beginning of the second intermission, Ignatius founded a special college in Rome for German-speaking Jesuits called Germanicum. Three years later, the Peace of Augsburg established the principle, Who's the religion? His the religion, unquote. The Peace of Augsburg was Jesuit pay dirt. They could now bring whole populations to Rome simply by winning over a few princes. And so they did. In 1560, the society had returned virtually all of the southern Germany and Austria to the Roman Catholic Church. And we'll continue with this reading in the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy to discover what the Jesuit order is all about on the broadcast tomorrow. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur and Cross the Border. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.